during the break there were some questions about how this could be used in practice. Well, this work was originally done by uh, Manesh in his master's thesis with the idea that of using it for process monitoring. So in a lumber mill, um, I've, I've just been in one lumber mill in Quebec a few years ago, and there, at the end of the mill, the boards are coming by at about three to four boards per second. So your ordinary uh, two by four by eight boards you buy at Home Depot, about three or four of those coming past you in a second. And then the manual operators. So the operators will stand there, the boards come vertically, and they're scanning it lengthways, and they're looking along with the board, they flip it once over, and they're look, trying to examine it for defects. And they'll put a little chalk mark on it, or they'll divert it in some way, and it will go into a pile for, uh, for good grade or poorer grade. And then, so if any misclassification by the operator, especially selling a good board into the bad uh, quality category leads to loss of money. So one, the proof of concept that Manish did in his study here was to, let's have a camera system, these boards pass by the cameras, and that camera system automatically finds the defect. So how would it work in practice? Well, if we go back here just to the slides, I think further down, Using the PCA model on a new pixel, imagine you've got a PCA model of of what's good good pixels and defects. You would use it as follows. Sorry, you've got your model, and you've got your number of wavelengths. You know your minimum and maximum scaling values for the scores, and you've got a score space mask. So you've got these regions in the score space. So this this here's one score space mask that captures defects of that type. So these splits in the wood and those knots are captured by this green mask. So I would store the vertices of that mask for that particular one. And then I would also store the second mask here shown in blue. I would store those vertices. And that mask would capture any pixels that correspond to that type of defect. Okay, so maybe these sorts of defects downgrade the value of the board much more than this sort of defect. Let's say this is a very mild defect over here. So we're not too concerned about those. We're much more concerned about those green defects than we are about the blue defects. Nevertheless, can we build a system that will in real time tell us how many defects we have of this type and how many defects we have of that second type? So if we get a new, a new board coming by, a new image. We've acquired it with our camera as X new. Now, X new has as many rows as there are pixels in that new image. So we've unfolded that new image, and it will have the K columns after the unfolding, and have many, many rows, depending on the number of pixels in X new. Now, notice here, I could even go apply this to a single pixel, or I could go apply it to a small region of the image, or I could apply it to the entire image in one go. This methodology is not sensitive to the size of your image. It's immaterial how big your image is, go apply to as small or as large an image as you like. The, the larger your image, just the more rows there are in X, that's all. Once you calculate your X nu and you've unfolded it, you multiply it by the row length to get your T's. And then you go scale those T's to scale them so that you get an integer between 0 and 255. Let's say I'm dealing with a single pixel, one particular pixel. I calculate my my, my T values, T1 and T2 for that new pixel. That's all I have, T1 and T2, two components. I go scale and center it, uh, scale it between 0 and 255, T1, scale T2 between 0 and 255. Now all I do is I come back to this mask, which I know goes from 0 on this end to 255, 0 to 255, and I find where that pixel lies. Let's say that pixel falls over here. I can say, well, that pixel doesn't fall in this mask, and it doesn't fall in that mask. So by default, then, that pixel corresponds to a good pixel. It must be from some other color on the wood. But if that pixel T1, T2 value happens to fall inside this region, I can be pretty sure that that pixel is a defect of this particular type. Or if it falls in that region over there where I had my blue mask, I can say, well, that pixel is of that second type of then what I do uh, is I 
I calculate for my new image, I just have a monitoring chart. And the upper limit on that monitoring chart is <coughs> a certain fraction of pixels that I'm willing to accept as defects. So let's say this is defect one. There's what the board with defect one. Defect one has this much, this many pixels. The moment that's above that limit, I can then send a signal to my uh, control system and divert that board to the category for lower grade lumber because it's got a number of defects above a limit that I pre-specified myself. And I would also then have a monitoring chart for defect two. And it would have its, a different upper control limit. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you pick that limit? Like, it looks to me like the middle one there is cracks in the middle, right? Yeah. Where the black one is not. It's like those would be classified differently. Yeah, so in other words, what we're saying, what we're seeing here is that we're not, we don't have the ability to separate splits from from knots. They're both showing up under the same mask over here. In fact, Manisha uh, did this work for his master's, then in his PhD he went on to show that if you use a near infrared camera, you can actually start to differentiate splits from knots, and you can actually tell about seven or eight different defects apart. With this crude color camera, RGB, you can only tell basic classes of defect, but you're right, you're absolutely right, you're grouping a split defect with a knot defect in the same group. But with a near-infrared camera, you've got more information coming in, you've got a, a much greater ability to distinguish between multiple defect types. I mean, you could still map that back, like map it back into the original image space, and then from there identify the shape. Good point, yeah, exactly right. You now go back into your image space, and you use this green, you create a new image that's <laughs> green or non-green. So you've got a black and white image, or a black, a, a black and green image, and then you use classical machine vision algorithms, edge detection, line detection, shape detection, and you do, you calculate the sphericity, and if, if it's got high sphericity, you can say it's a knot. If it's got low sphericity, it's likely a line. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, you're, you're basically what you'll see here in this whole section today, you're limited by your imagination, right? Anything that you can see with your eye visually, and you can try and quantify, you say, like, how would I try to automate this? You think, well, what am I doing? If I look, like Randy just said, if I look at this picked image, how can I tell that's a split and that's a knot? What is it that your brain is doing to differentiate splits from knots? The shape, the shape, or how elongated it is. So you can ask now, well, how can I make a computer do this for me automatically? Okay, and that's the damn hard part. You'll, I've worked in image analysis for so many years, and it's really, really tough to try and make your computer do what your head does in a split second. Which is why, to this day, we have so many manual operators in the process. Even if you're getting a manual operator back, but it's better than that. But a manual operator will be able to tell that quickly. Yeah. A computer, you can make it do that. That's actually an easy thing to make a computer do. But there's so many things that you cannot make a computer do that you, you start to realize that when you're looking at images, or just the world around you, how much processing your brain is doing. Because if you try to ever automate that, you'll realize how complex it is. The other thing is, we'll talk about it a bit at the end, but here I've got the image looking like this. If I go change the light, and I make the image slightly darker, all my pixels shift around, and my score plot becomes totally different. And you start to create misclassification. But it's not really a misclassification because the image is still the same. All you've done is you change the light. Your brain, you, your mind, undoes that shift in the light, and you still differentiate the knots from the splits. But a computer now becomes and throws up false positives because of the lighting has changed. So just to compensate for something as basic as the lighting is extremely hard in image analysis. So when I was doing image projects, I would spend about 80-90% of my time just trying to figure out ways to do robustly what the brain does in the split second. And, and that's the hard part, but it's also the interesting part. If someone could follow up 
Okay. Is there a way to graph or like select how much mass of that certain number of black is in one area and use that to classify it? That would be a pretty good graph for a, for a block. Yeah, so yeah, you would take you take the number of pixels and you, you now write an algorithm that says if this pixel is connected to another defect pixel, and then that pixel is connected to another defect pixel, and so I'm forming a whole group of pixels, then that's likely a defect that's a, a knot. Whereas over here, here if I try to connect one pixel to the other, I can see if I move left and right or up and down, I can move up and down quite a bit and connect defect pixels to each other, but left and right I can't move. And so that's how you could differentiate splits from knots based on the, the geometry. In fact, that is exactly how these, these uh, defect detection methods work. They start at the top left corner of the image and they form combinations and they move out trying to connect pixels to each other. And the bigger they can make the connection, it's called a blob, the bigger the blob, the more likely it's, it's a, of that shape. The, the smaller the blob or the more elongated it is, the more likely it's a split. So there's all sorts of algorithms called edge detection, line detection, circle detection, blob detection, but they're all more, more and more computationally tested. Sir, can you spread out how do you like, what's the best way to spread out? Like, they do all, it's a combinatorial problem. So they just do everything. That's why classical machine vision algorithms take so long to process because they're trying to process all the possible combinations. You as your, your eye, you can go right to that and you can see visually where the edge is. But a computer has no notion of that. It has to start at one point of view, work left, right, and find connections between the image. So the area of, of machine vision is super fascinating. Like the, how you make a computer do what, what we would consider trivial. It's, really, it's a really fascinating and interesting um, branch of engineering. If you ever want to get into it, it's, it's, it's fun. But it's it's tough to try and make a computer do what you do. <laughs> yeah. Which is why I think we'll have operators for quite some time still. <laughs> We're not gonna have a plant sitting there with no lights on and no people working in it, but us sitting around the circuit pool drinking beers. There's a matrix. It's not, not gonna happen. Okay, so let's uh, move on. Uh, one final thing to note is when you're building these latent variable models. One question you often have is, what if I've got multiple images? I want to build my model from multiple images that represent different sources of variation. So if I was trying to build a model to detect defects, I would want to build my PCA model not just on one board and then expect it to work on all sorts of boards. I would want to build my model based on spruce, on pine, on fir, and different types of defects under different lighting conditions. And so one trivial way you can do that is you just take your images and you put them side by side or top to bottom and just create one monster image and put that into the software. That would be perfectly valid. But you can do it far more elegantly by just calculating X transpose X on the first image, add that to X transpose X on the second image, up until the final image, you create a composite X transpose X matrix, and then you go ahead and calculate the loadings from that. You'll get exactly the same answer if you do those two. This one is more computationally efficient. This one you don't have to load a big image into RAM in one go. This one you can load this image, calculate a very small X transpose X, empty your RAM out, load the next image, calculate X transpose X. Now it sounds trivial to say like, why would I want to empty my RAM for a five megapixel camera? But speak to Sianak upstairs who's dealing with medical images that are a gigabyte each. So you can't load 10 gigabytes into your computer, create your one image. He has to load one gigabyte image, calculate X transpose X, clears his RAM up, loads his second gigabyte, adds that to the previous X transpose X, which is a very, very small matrix, and then keeps going that way. So just to summarize what MIA is doing here before we move on to the applications, Objects in the image that have the same spectral signature, the same wavelength characteristics, no matter where they are spatially in the image, they could be anywhere, they will appear in the same region of the score space. So as a result, we say there's a many-to-one mapping between the image space and the score space. One location in the score space, one, uh, let me raise my image here, one T1, let's take a T1, T2 location in my score space, if I map that back to the image space, that can correspond to multiple
pixel locations back in the original image. But many pixels in the original image with the same spectral signature will appear in one location in the school screen. So there's a many to one relationship there. As a result, you'll see in the applications I look at today, we use this when spatial relationships are not too important. I'll come back to this at the end if it makes more sense and proceed on. Okay, so let's look at this first application. I'm going to go a little bit in depth into this because Hong Lu's uh, work on the flame imaging is really, really, uh, it covers a lot of ground in terms of, of theoretical concepts and it's also a nice application study. So what she worked with the company here in Canada, in fact, has a, a boiler to create steam. And most large companies and refineries will have a boiler on site where they load, uh, where they pass water through pipes and they heat that up using natural gas or some energy source to create steam. So they combust natural gas or other type of waste fuel to generate steam from water. This particular company to try, uh, wants to burn off a lot of, or some of their, their liquid waste. So rather than paying to dispose that, they burn it. So they supplement their natural gas, which they purchase from, or from the market, which has a known energy content, it's very predictable, very stable. They supplement their natural gas with their own liquid waste. That liquid waste has variable energy content. And so the problem they have is, how much liquid waste do I use so that I generate a fairly constant level of steam at the top. So your steam demand for this company is pretty constant, they want to keep that stable, but you've got this variable energy source. So if you just allow that liquid flow to be the same flow rate, you're going to get a variable flow rate of steam, which is undesirable. So what you want to do is you want to counteract the variability in the energy content of this liquid waste. You want to if that energy content is low, you want to increase the flow rate of that liquid energy. Burn more of it so you bring your energy, total energy consumption to be able to roughly the same value. So Hong Lu's aim was to, can we predict the steam flow rate coming out of this boiler from the flame itself? It's pretty, it sounds pretty, pretty weird. And even to this day, Hong Lu doesn't believe that it works. She's still, still like, it's, 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 <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say that. it's just like, it's, it doesn't seem right. Why does this work? Why can you use an image to predict steam flow rates? It seems a little bit too good to be true. And um, let's take a look at what she did. So I'll show you some of the video imagery of the, of the flame in a minute. But there's an analog camera here in the boiler. Most boilers have that. And all the operators really do with that image is they use it to see if the, if the flame is on or off. <laughs> They don't do anything more with that image other than that a sophisticated on and off sense. So we're asking, can we do a little bit more with that information and just really put it on a TV screen there in the corner of the operator's room? Can we actually use the digitized version? She has a video card here, requires the data on the computer and then get the prediction. So when Honglu was doing this work, every month she would get a package from the company via FedEx and it would be videotapes that they had digitized from this um, on this uh, flame. So they actually, not video tapes, they were sent a hard drive to the mail of the digital images. <laughs> and they also sent her the data from the process. So she knew what the steam flow rate was, her Y variable. She also knew the natural gas and the waste stream flow rate. So here's a very short snippet of time where the company actually did a little bit of an experiment. They varied the liquid fuel flow rate here, shown um, by the exit. So they decrease the liquid fuel flow rate down. And to keep the steam rate kind of constant, but not, as you see here below, the steam rate didn't stay constant. But what they did is they kept the natural gas constant, and then they had ramped that up to try and compensate for it. So natural gas has to go up here at the end to come to, to get the steam flow rate back. Now, what we've shown here are those points D, P, and F on the previous image, on the previous uh, time series, D, P, and F over there. We show the flame images one second apart. So this is at, at time instant D. 
and for whatever that time instant is, we're showing two images one second apart. The process is obviously stable at that point. It, it's running with that flow rate of liquid fuel, that flow rate of gas, and generating 30 kilograms per second of steam at that point in time. But you can see how very different the two images are one second apart. Yet the process is obviously operating at those conditions. At point E, we're operating at those conditions, very different flame image uh, between those two. But also you're starting to see the flame itself as I compare D to E, it looks a little bit different. Right? There's a little bit more color to it, a little bit more golden color. This one seems a bit white and washed out. Then as we're going totally to natural gas, the liquid fuel here is turned off. We're not burning any liquid fuel at this position N. The flame is much smaller and is a definitely a more richer redder color than it is up here when we were running full out with our liquid fuel and we in the middle of the range of natural gas. So there is some spectral difference between those three conditions. <coughs> and here are the corresponding score plots between time and D, E, and F. And here's where it's really interesting. Even though back up here in position D, I'm comparing these two flame images. The flame images in the image space appear very, very different from each other between one second and the next. But back in the score space, it's imperceptible the difference. This score image from that to that looks very, very similar. Identical score images, pretty much. Okay. And that makes absolute sense because the process is operating at the same steam flow rate, the same natural gas flow rate, and sorry, the same liquid waste and the same uh, natural gas flow rate and producing the same steam output. So those two, those variables are constant at this time d, and those two score plots look identical and are stable. While the image space is very, very dynamic and changing quite a bit. At condition e, we can see our score space has shifted up a little bit up in that direction, we're getting a, a few more pixels in this zone than we had before. And then when we're operating full out with natural gas, we're seeing that this zone over here shifted a little bit over to the center. When you compare one score plot to the next, the distribution of pixels in that score plot has changed. But if we compare score plot one second apart between the left and the right columns here, we're seeing very, very stable, very, very similar score plots. So what I did was just, uh, I got a few seconds of the video clip from Hongmu and I digitized him up and score space, but not nearly as much as the variation in the image space. So I forget how many how many seconds of operation there are over there on the left hand side in the image. But those are all from the same period of time. So the same natural gas flow rate, the same um, waste flow rate, and likely the same energy content of that same waste stream. So that's generating this very dynamic flame, but the score space here is extremely stable. So I'll, I'll actually put this video clip up on the website. You can go download it and you can use MATLAB or Python or any tool to extract the RGB images out of that video clip. So you can go apply PCA on each frame and generate that score plot over there on the left hand side. Right hand side yeah. so what's the advantage of using a photo instead of a thermal couple and a steam flow rate? Yeah, so the, the, you could use the steam flow rate and then um, compensate, I guess, for the for the natural gas flow rate. I guess, uh, sorry, compensate for the waste stream. That's the question. Yeah, this would be an easier way to do it than this. Yeah, right. I think uh, that just is very uh, variable and like see what goes wrong with the camera when you have like natural gas or pumping at crazy fast rates. I think with this would be extremely useful. 
if you're, you're absolutely right, if it's instantaneous, the effect from, if you're seeing a drop off in the steam flow rate, and to compensate for that, I'm gonna ramp up the energy, I'm gonna ramp up the flow rate of my waste stream. And if I make that change, I see an immediate change in my steam flow rate. But if there's any sort of time delay, you may be better off um, using an image because you're now, you're seeing the image as it's delivering the heat. The, if this, the increased steam flow may only be seen a few seconds or minutes later. Yeah, you get, a far, you get an earlier estimate of the drop off or increase in, in steam flow rate with the image because there's a time delay from when the flame has to generate the steam and then you see it at the outlet, maybe a couple of seconds or, or maybe as much as a minute. Yeah. This and where, where your valve would be here, you're seeing it much earlier upstream. I was just worried that if, if someone opens up the chamber and flashes the light, yeah. no, no, you can't. This is that. totally closed. No, there's no human yeah. entry into this. No, no. Uh, I didn't explain it earlier, but this camera is actually housed in a very special unit that has to keep it cool with liquid water, and it's, it's kept in a very expensive enclosure. In fact, there's no uh, absolutely no human uh, entry into this area as well. This is too warm, too hot. <laughs> where this has been used very, uh, your question's a good question, uh, where it has been used much more is uh, with uh, cement kilns, where the time delays are huge, they're like in order of minutes. You still got a flame, but you're only seeing the effect of it 30 minutes to an hour coming out at the end of the kiln. So that, uh, and, uh, there's a publication I referenced here in the notes at the end on that. Uh, you get better response. So coming back to what Brandon asked earlier, can we reconstruct the image from those scores? Absolutely. What Hong Lu has gone and done here, she found that the third component is mainly noise, and she reconstructs the image based only T1 and T2. So there's the original image, calculate T1, T2, reconstruct it. So you're really just filtering in the score space. <laughs> you're throwing away that third component, which is illustrated here, mostly just grayscale noise. So there's really no sense in keeping that component around. She uses the reconstructed image now uh, in, in the future. So as I said, you know, we're seeing the image space changing very rapidly from one frame to the next. And some companies have actually gone and tried to build systems that use just the frame uh, by frame image space to monitor the process. And what they'll go do is they'll go calculate the perimeter of the frame, of the flame, the area, the sphericity, the luminosity, Entropy, the sum of absolute values, maximum, minimum intensity, number of colors in the image. They're capturing all these features and they're trying to predict something at the end. But as you can expect, these features are going to change just as rapidly as the original image. So your x variables are bouncing around quite a bit. And you're trying to predict a stable, smooth y. It's not going to work out quite so well. Okay. So. What, we, what Hong Lu wants to go do here, her, her objective is to let me use the score space now, which is much more stable, and I extract features from my score space and use those features to try and predict why. Rather than trying to use features that I extract directly from the image, let me go and first use the score space, kind of as a mechanism to filter out these, these dynamics that we see in the image space. Okay, there is one important step though, there's some, uh, segmentation we need to do. Now segmentation is a word uh, that comes from the machine vision literature. It means to divide the image into more, a uh, two or more regions. So we're going to segment the region into flame versus non-flame. In the lumber image example we looked at just a minute ago, we were segmenting the image into wood versus defect one versus defect two. So we had three category segmentation. Here we're just going to do a binary segmentation, flame versus non-flame. And she found that pixels falling under this green mask in T1, T2, those correspond to the non-flame pixels. So here's the original image. If I go and just set to a, a, a uniform color those pixels that fall under this mask, I'm isolating the flame pixels from my non-flame pixels. And this is a very good, very quick way to do segmentation. Traditional approaches, they go and look across the image and they try to find boundaries, they draw lines. And if I draw a horizontal line at this particular location over there, the 
that on my x-axis, I would see values of zero, and then I would see a sharp rise, <coughs> then it would drop off again. Okay, so if I just drew a horizontal, uh, across that horizontal row, I take those pixel values, and I plot them between zero and 255, I might see that sort of arrangement. And traditional approaches, they just say, I'm going to cut off over there. Any pixel that's above that zone, I'm going to consider flame. Any pixels below that zone, I'm going to consider non-flame. But if you go try and do this, you'll get a, a very crude and very poor segmentation. This approach here by using the score space is, is, is a lot faster and gets you a cleaner edge on that. Because as you can imagine, it's not just a sudden rise where your pixels are lower and then suddenly high at the boundary of the flame. There's a, there's a smearing effect there. But uh, PCA segmentation is usually much, much faster and cleaner to do. So she goes and segments the image and, and, and separates the flame from the non-flame feature. And then she goes and extracts these features from the image after doing the separation. So she uses the score space to find flame versus non-flame. And in the flame region, she goes and calculates the number of pixels. So that's the surface area of the flame, as seen by the camera lens. So the front appearance of the flame, how many pixels appear to be in the flame zone. The average intensity, so take this flame region over here, just these pixels in that zone, convert that color image now, that red, green, and blue image, over to a grayscale image using the formula I showed earlier. So now you've got a single channel image, and then you go calculate the average of those pixel values from that grayscale value. So in this particular case, it should be a number pretty close to 255 towards the higher range, the brighter that the flame is. And represents the average intensity of the flame. Those same pixels that I just pointed out, you can go calculate the standard deviation. That would give you an indication of the uniformity of the flame. So if my entire flame was very bright white <coughs> over here, my standard deviation would be a low number. The more and more different colors appear in the zone, the higher that standard deviation would be. So the uniformity of the flame is another feature she goes and calculates. She also goes and calculates an average intensity same as, as feature B here. Feature B was the average intensity of the flame pixels. W is the average intensity of the background pixels, or the wall of the um, the wall of the boiler. Those, remember I said earlier, she goes and reconstructs the image x hat from the first two scores. She goes and takes that x hat, the reconstructed image, for the entire image. And she goes and calculates the average RGB values and then multiplies those by the loading. So that's x nu times the loading p will give you a t1, t2 score location for the mean image. So that's telling you if I had to summarize the pixel, the entire image by a single number for the red channel, a single average for the green, a single average for the blue, where would that average pixel lie in my score space? That's what that score one, score two mean would be. And if I had to go repeat that same process, but this time I only use the flame pixels, I calculate the score one and score two for my average flame color. And then the number of colors in the flame region. So go back here to the flame and count up the number of unique colors that appear in that particular zone. So every image then, that's recorded by the video camera, we've got our, our raw image. We go through a number of steps here, calculating <laughs> scores, separating flame from non-flame, extracting features, and at the end, we land up with a single row vector of features. Okay. So in her case, there were eight or nine different features calculated. We've, sum we've tried to summarize the entire image at one second in time, by a much, much smaller number of features. So here we're going from 56 kilobytes down to 8 times 16 kilobytes, uh, bytes, sorry. So much, much smaller summary of information, of data, 
into another form of data. And hopefully these eight features we calculate are much, much more useful than the, than the original image. So we do this very quickly and it's very easy to calculate on the computer in real time. And then we also have our Y variable. This is my Y, E1, X is, and that is steam. So in her training data set, she had multiple images and multiple steam values, and then built a PLS model to relate these features now over to Y. You can't go build a PLS model between your original image and Y because there's no way you can line up the data from this image over to one. So it's much, much easier to extract from your raw image just the relevant features that you believe will be useful to predicting Y and then line that up to, to actually get your Y from the data. So uh, before I show some results, the features that we calculated, remember I kind of said the classical tools, they go ahead and they calculate features from the plane directly, from the image directly. Well, haven't we really done the same thing? Right? We kind of have, right? We calculated features from the image as it relates to the plane. We've also gone and calculated the average number of pixels in the plane region, the average intensity, standard deviation. All of those features we've gone and calculated are based on the flame or the non-flame region of the image. So they're also going to be just as variable. So we haven't really gained anything by doing this. Other than using the score space as a good way to separate flame from non-flame pixels, and we've used the score space to calculate this reconstructed image over here. So no surprise in that if you plot those features here in light, in darker gray, they're pretty variable. So here's one of the features. Um, I've, I've dropped the label of the image, unfortunately. So the, the darker gray shows you the tremendous amount of variability, actually, in that, in that single feature. So it's not quite as stable as we might have hoped for. What Henri then went to go do is, well, we've got three different approaches to try and smooth that out. One way is, let's say we're trying to smooth it out over one minute of operation. So we've got 60 consecutive images. One thing you might try to do is just take 60 images and average all of them. So sum up 60 images and calculate an average color image from that. And you can see that's just a big blur. There's not much information you can extract from it. The other approach is calculate your features and then use a moving average with a window width of 60. So use 60 samples of uh, features and then just calculate the average of those 60 features. That would also work just fine. Or what Honolulu ended up doing here was take 60 consecutive score images, which over a period of one minute should be roughly the same because they're all from the same type of operation. They're very stable. Calculate the average score space, reconstruct your image from that average score space then instead, and then calculate your features from that reconstructed image. And in fact, if you compare two and three, you get very similar performance. So it's indicating really you're using your score space here as a, as a filter. And uh, so these two lines that you see kind of overlapping each other here in the middle represent uh, the second and third approach. This uh, outer, outer gray area represents your raw data. Now, one thing before, uh, before we even get over here to the PLS is let's just go do a PCA on our X space on those features and superimpose onto that X space the we also have two other variables added to our X space, the liquid fuel flow rate and the natural gas flow rate. Just to understand how, if anything, we can see how the features relate to those uh, <coughs> those two flow rates. And what we can see with when we're using waste fuel over here, we're getting a bigger flame that corresponds to A, the area. So A was the number of pixels in the flame region. We're getting a bigger flame. These pixels, these uh, variables are correlated with each other. We're getting a brighter flame, and we're getting uh, U is uniformity, 
which corresponds to the standard deviation. So we're actually getting a higher standard deviation when we see when we're using liquid fuel flow. And it, and it makes sense, right? As we're using liquid fuel, we're getting less and less uniformity in our image, a higher standard deviation, a brighter flame with a greater area. If I go back up here, when we were using liquid fuel, versus over here we were using no liquid fuel, yes, these flames, these flames are brighter. And there is a bit more variability than over, the, over there. Also, what's really interesting here is how the wall pixels start to show up. Over here, we don't see any of the wall pixels. So the, the, the wall of the boiler, you see this orange glow here on the edge on the wall. Remember Hong Lu had a feature for the average color of the non-flame pixels? That would pick up the average of this zone outside the flame. For natural gas, you would start to get a much greater value for that feature. And in fact, W, the feature that corresponds to the, the average intensity of the wall of the background, is extremely tightly correlated to natural gas. So that's a very, very strong correlation of it. And that's so surprising because it's telling you you're able to predict your natural gas flow rate just by counting the number of non-flame pixels. In fact, it's the reflection of the flame on the wall of the boiler that's much more correlated to one of the interesting variables in the system. Okay? So again, this is why I say don't just Many people will just go straight from the raw data, calculate the features, and build a PLS model, and they'll bypass investigating the loadings plot at all. They just want to get a prediction from their system. But if you spend some time actually looking at these predictions, you can learn quite a bit from it. This may actually tell you, I might be better off focusing my camera on not the flame, but somewhere else in my in my board. Or make sure that my, my camera captures both the wall of the board as well as the flame. The capture of the both. There's also a strong correlation with where the T1, T2 values lie in the image. I'll leave that for you to investigate. You can go look back at the score plots for T1 and T2. When I showed when we were using natural gas, when we weren't using natural gas, uh, uh, sorry, when we were using waste fuel and we were worked, you can confirm to yourself that, that um, those score value correlations would make sense. And then finally, we get pretty good predictions here. On the training data, she used a very small amount of training data in her testing data set. Um, I think it was only 30 observations used to build the model, and then 130 used to test it. And uh, pretty, pretty good performance and predictability of the steam flow rate over there. Okay, so we'll just. Uh, oh, sorry. Another, another interesting way to look at it, like you did for the Kappa number, you plot it as a time series. So here we're showing the observed versus predicted value, and seeing similar trends, which is great. Now, obviously, this is a very short time frame to, to try and consider for the study. So, like I said, you should probably consider a greater depth of information to see if this would work as a soft sensor over the long term. Let's just wrap up here before we uh, take a break. Let's just recap. This, very, this to me, is so critical that of all the things you understand from multivariate image analysis is that the score space is capturing how the spectral information clusters. So only spectral information is captured in the score. So pixels that are brighter from the flame, they cluster together. Non-flame pixels cluster together. You lose your, all your spatial relationships. There's, there's no connection back to the spatial world, the XY world anymore. Once you go to the score space, you lose absolutely all of that spatial um, ability. But you can get a bit of that back when you mask in your score space and you map that mask back to your image space and as you were saying earlier, Brandon, you then go use the spatial tools to go uh, decide where features are on the mask. But the hardest part is, and Hong Lu mentioned this more than once to me uh, when she was working, is the hardest part is knowing which features to extract. right? Because let's say I go build this model, X versus Y, and I get poor prediction of my, of my steam flow rate. What can I go do about it? Let's say I've decided on, on four or five features to extract from the image, and based on those four images, I'm not getting quite as good predictions of Y. What would be your next step? 
different features, but which ones, right? Right, because presumably when you calculated those features the first time, you picked the features that you thought would have been sufficient to capture and predict why. But after building your model, you go discover that, well, hang on, those features are not quite as predictive as I was hoping for. So you're now back to the beginning again, but there's no guidance either on what you might do better the second time around. There's nothing telling you these, sure you might see these features are not quite so correlated with Y, but there's no guidance to tell you which features might be correlated with Y. You really are just left up to your own ingenuity to capture that. And so that's why Omu told me more than once, I just don't know always which are the right features to calculate. So uh, you'll see a lot of people, they just do a brute force approach. They take the images and they, they pile up, uh, they go through an algorithm and will just extract 90, 100 different features and they plug that into PLS and pick the ones that do the best. Uh, but I think at the end, yeah, you do have to kind of sit back and think, well, what is it that I'm trying to predict here? And where, what, what is it that visually, can I see it visually even in my image? And then secondly, what can I do to go and extract out that visual information to predict why? It's a tough, it's a tough problem. Anyway, so let's take a break.